Okay, good morning, everyone. And uh, our panel will be following the previous panel. And I talked about some of the trends. I uh, look at it from both a conflict um, trends perspective and a rule of law perspective. Um, but we want to round up this conversation by looking ahead. Um, uh, a lot of the focus on insecurity across Africa is generally about what's going on today. Who are the bad guys we need to address today? What are the issues we need to solve today? Where, how do we address uh, the um, neo-patrimonialism <laughs> today? And But well, the reality is that the continent is not just dynamic, meaning all those causative factors are interacting with each other in complex ways on an ongoing basis, but it's also evolving. If I asked you to cast in your mind's eye about a decade forward, what's Africa going to look like? And what do we need to know today to prepare for what those changes are going to do to the security landscape? And to what extent are our interventions going to be relevant, let alone effective? So I want to really quickly talk about some of these changes that we know are going to come, uh, what it means for insecurity, and what some of the implications are. And we'll play a quick uh, game, a thought um, experiment, and just think through, okay, so then how do we unpack all of this from a security perspective? I'm going to go through four things. One is demography. Africa's population is growing quite um, significantly. Um, it's a continent with the highest um, growth rates across the, um, across the globe. Um, by 2050, one in four people on this planet will be African. That's a headline um, statistic that usually grips us. One in four on the planet would be African. And immediately that conjures things like the youth bunch. It conjures things like uh, population pressures on scarce resources. It conjures things like families where, in some countries, average family size is a little over seven per female. What does that mean when it comes to the way we um, address it, we, we think about insecurity? But one thing we don't usually get into is the population structure. For me, that is more important when it comes to security analysis than just the aggregate numbers. Because when you think, we look at the population pyramid in most African countries today, we have a really wide-based triangle with the vast majority of Africans being less than 35 years old. In many countries, less than 15 years old. But what happens when that, um, in the next, um, in the coming decades, what happens when that triangle starts to compress at the bottom, but expand in some places at the top? How do we understand what the dependency ratio is going to be? That, for me, is one of the, one of the, one of the things I like to leave with you when it comes to demography. It's not just the numbers, it is the structure of the population pyramid. Second is climate. Um, whether or not you believe in climate change, whether or not you have a view on what causes climate variability, we do know that certain parts of the continent are going to be hotter, other parts are going to be drier. Um, cities are, um, uh, that are along the coast are going to have to deal with potential changes in the um, sea level. And if you superimpose thoughts about climate when it comes to aridity and heat on population, you would see a lot of the areas that are going to see experience the greatest stress when it comes to climate variability over time, 
are the same areas that are going to have the greatest spurts when it comes to aggregate numbers. And we talked about the dynamism of, of, of Africa and um, of, of, of all these factors. So when climate and population start working together, you start seeing the makings of a complex emergency. Because not only are they going to have fewer opportunities for their livelihoods, they're probably not going to be able to live where they lived before. And so we're going to see a lot more movement. So as you think about what the megatrends are telling us about the future, think about, and you think about how they interact with each other, the question then becomes, how does that reshape our thinking? And so, naturally, we're going to see a lot of people moving. Some are going to move willingly for economic and other reasons. Others are going to be forced. Forced migration is going to be one of the challenges of the next, um, of the next couple of decades. Because people are going to be forced to move. Because climate variability is going to make certain places less habitable than others. Um, population pressures are going to push people. And generally, when we think about um, migration in Africa, the first thing that comes to mind is the Mediterranean and the people who are, some people who are perishing there, and how many people are crossing over into um, Europe. Um, ballpark figures, about 250,000. Within the continent, we're talking about over 20 million. And so when you think about migration, the issue is not what's happening in the Mediterranean. The issue is, is what is happening within the continent. And what's happening within the continent has implications for security that are transnational because people are moving from one African country to another African country. People are moving within their own country because they become either forcibly displaced or they're seeking economic um, opportunities. And uh, I think in the last panel, um, Paul alluded to the change in state-citizen relationship, when you have certain parts of the continent becoming less populated and others becoming more populated. Africa is also the most rapidly urbanizing region in the world more people are going to be living in cities. And this means, for those of you who are political science um, majors or grads, um, everything we knew or we are taught about the core periphery theories in understanding politics, in understanding governance, and in understanding um, conflict, you're going to have to throw out the window. Because the periphery is coming to the core. And again, it's not just the aggregate numbers, as I mentioned with demography. It is the structure. If you look at uh, a lot of the, um, the, um, slide, the uh, diagram to your left, it shows not just the fact that the urban areas are going to increase. It shows the proportion of that increase that will be living in slums. Where which are unregulated, underserviced, and tinder for instability. So when you think through urbanization, it's, it's not just uh, the numbers, but also the structure. More people, a lot more people, are going to be living in slums. So how do you then begin to think through, from a rule of law perspective, policing and, and, and other things? It becomes an urban issue but most of us are prepared for the traditional core periphery type conflicts. So, two things. One, the landscape is changing and changing rapidly. But secondly, if you look at all the megatrends, they're all interrelated. Demography is influenced by climate. Migration explains urbanization. Urbanization is a product of a number of the others, particularly um, 
um, growth in population and the reduction in uh, both livelihoods and economic opportunities in the most fragile and stressed parts of the continent. So all of these have um, important um, security implications, and they're going to affect insecurity in different ways. All right. So one of listening to the questions, a theme that seemed to resonate across is, okay, okay, okay. You've told us about the trends. Yeah, now you're talking about the mega trends. What do we do about it? And I think it forces us. You can hear me. It forces us to re rethink some fundamentals, not just about what we can and cannot do, but how do we respond? Because we've talked about a number. I'm going to. We are going to look at climate. wanted to do um, demography as well, but let's just do demography and climate together, all right? This is actually based on a lot of work that we've been um, doing at the Africa Center on these issues. Um, Paul Williams just talked about not just the factors, but typologies of, in, of, of, of insecurity. So when you want to ask yourself the question, what does all of this mean for insecurity? Insecurity in Africa or anywhere is not a monolith. It manifests in different ways. You could have violent extremism. You could have um, one-sided. Sided conflicts. You could have race. You could have state sponsored. Or like you have your traditional good old fashioned battles. Where one armed group fights another. So just quickly as a thought experiment. If we had to think, violent extremism, would it, would, it have a, would it be driven a lot by climate and, uh, by climate and demography? Show sure of hands, yes or no? So we'll say medium likelihood. What about urbanization? Will there be more violent extremism if we have more urbanization? Yes or no? Mm, I'm seeing there's some reluctance. So let's say medium to high. We can go through all of this, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to. But the point is, it's not easy. It's a challenge. And we generally leap to conclusions when it comes to what does this mean and how do I not just understand insecurity, but also the implications of the factors that drive insecurity on the type of insecurity that we are going to see. And that's going to vary vastly across, um, across the continent. Just very quickly, there are a number of implications. Um, first, I'd like to talk a little bit about is this core periphery issue. We generally think that if we could address institutions, we could address individuals in the capital cities, they will then go out and, 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 and um, hopefully, you know, address the drivers or the simmering issues, not just in the cities, but outside in the um, villages and the towns. But what happens when the villages and the towns are predominantly in the cities? Um, does it become a military issue or is it a law enforcement issue? Or do we need another, another mechanism to, uh, to address this? 
the state-citizen relationship really evolves because are the mayors and governors going to be the ones who require the capacity and the capability a lot more than the members of parliament from far-flung regions? I tell people that uh, these cities are becoming, you know, like the driving force, not just for the politics, but also the e economics. The GDP of Lagos State is greater than the GDP of Ivory Coast or Kenya. Does it become more important? Are the cities becoming more important than the nation states? Also, we have to think about what this tells us about fragility. Generally, we think about fragility, we think about ungov ungoverned or poorly governed regions. What happens when fragility is more systemic? It's an ecosystem issue. A different question. And lastly, I want to talk, just want to mention the fact that, um, you know, in a, a meeting we had, a seminar we had earlier this year, someone made the remark that um, when uh, instability in a country reaches a border, it doesn't wait and ask for a visa to cross the border and go into the next country. It, does, it, ju it just does. Whether this is health-related, like Ebola, violent extremism, transnational organized crime, civil unrest, it's a transnational issue. So how do you, and uh, thinking about, um, thinking this through a traditional state-centric prism, address a transnational problem. Many cases when it comes to the megatrends, population, climate, urbanization, and uh, migration, really the train has left the station. It's happening already. You go to the continent, you will see it. And so I think you have three options. You could either try to slow the train down through mitigation efforts. You could try to redirect the train by focusing on new opportunities. Or you could try to repurpose the train. And this is where the creative use of partnerships comes in. But we cannot sweep it under the carpet. We cannot assume that in 10, 20 years, we'll be dealing with the same Africa, not just in terms of the aggregate um, figures, but the structure and the way that the that society is organized and the way that state so state society relationships and state slash citizen relationships with natural resources are going to be defined. And so I uh, I'll uh, pass it on to my colleague um, Michelle to take it from here and continue the conversation. Thanks. <laughs>